Piltzik. I'm business columnist at the Los Angeles Times and author of The New Deal, A Modern History. And I'm here with R.J. Esco, a senior fellow at the Campaign for America's Future, to talk about the negotiations going on in Washington over the so-called fiscal cliff. And I think our theme should be everything you're not being told about what's really happening with these negotiations and, and what they're about. This is the theme of my LA Times column, which will be appearing in tomorrow's paper, that's Wednesday's paper, and will be up online later today. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the main theme of the column is that what's really being discussed in Washington uh, in these discussions over these budget cuts and, and tax hikes that are online for January 1st is austerity. Uh, the, the, the negotiators seem to have taken it on board that what they want to do is impose some form of fiscal austerity on the American public and what they're really discussing uh, is who's going to get whacked mostly by austerity and I think we can all assume that the wealthy are probably going to come out of this better than anybody else and that means that what's really at issue is Social Security and, and Medicare. And uh, Richard, why don't we start by, by your talking a little bit about how you see the, the fiscal landscape and, and what, uh, what your concerns are, what your insights are about how these negotiations are going to unfold. Well, you know, 30 years ago, it was, uh, first of all, thanks for having me, Michael, but, you know, 30 years ago, it was uh, a kind of a political science truism that the media can't tell you what to think, but they can tell you what to think about, and I think we may have even progressed beyond or below that point now where, they, you know, there's a lot of influence on what people think as well, but between the, the political debate and the media coverage of the political debate, everyone's talking about cutting government spending primarily reducing the deficits but with an emphasis on spending cuts at a time when we really should be talking about rebuilding the economy so it, it's it's posed it, it's the wrong emphasis at the wrong time uh, you know to me the analogy is water conservation water conservation is a great principle in and should be uh, uh, adhered to except when your house is on fire so right now we're in the midst of our genuine emergency in terms of ongoing recession like economic conditions uh, people underpaid underworking out of work and we're talking about deficits when we should be talking about rebuilding the economy so the, the the entire context for the conversation is off and then I would layer on to that this notion of a a fiscal cliff which is an absolutely artificial uh, crisis you know the other day I googled the words fiscal cliff and looming and I got 72,000 hits on right. fiscal cliff when there is no crisis looming with the fiscal cliff there is a, a present crisis with jobs and um, and economic growth and wage stagnation wealth inequity so you know it's the wrong de it's the wrong debate at the wrong time and that's why I really appreciate the columns like the one uh, that will come out by you tomorrow because I think we need to shift the terms of this debate right you're absolutely right the, the terms of the debate have been uh, ridiculously constrained um, uh, for one thing, the very term, the fiscal cliff, which, which evidently uh, was coined or at least popularized out of a speech that Ben Bernanke gave some time ago, but it suggests that there's some sort of elemental uh, natural uh, event coming up when in fact what we're facing is, as, as you said, completely artificial. It's 100% a creation of the debt limit negotiations from a, a, a year and a half ago when it was the only way uh, for President Obama to bring Republicans in Congress on board was to set up, as we said, this, this artificial deadline so that Congress and the White House could be forced to do something at some point down the line. Now, now one thing that, that we should talk about, which is uh, something that, that I've written about and you've written about uh, as, as recently as I think today, maybe yesterday uh, uh, on the Huff Post is uh, the role of Pete Peterson in all this. And I did a column, uh, I, I think a month, maybe a month and a half ago, about identifying Peterson as the, the most influential billionaire in Washington who you've never heard of. And it, it's remarkable that all of these uh, supposed grassroots organizations 
organizations of CEOs in Washington who are out there beating the bushes and talking about how uh, the, the deficit is the, the ultimate crisis for the republic and we've got to do something about that before we do anything else. All of these organizations fix the debt. The CAN kicks back, which purports to be a, a youth movement uh, to, uh, to cut the deficit. Um, the Third Way, which, uh, as, as you wrote, put out a, an entirely bogus poll that suggests that the American public is dying for deficit relief. Well, they all have links to Pete Peterson. He's been out there for years and years spending hundreds of millions of dollars uh, basically on behalf of, of his worldview, which is unalterably hostile to Social Security and Medicare. So why don't you talk a little bit about the Third Way and... Uh, and, and fix the debt, and, and Peterson, and, and what's really dangerous about this guy? I mean, he's not like the Koch brothers. He's not like George Soros. He's not, a, I think, for the, the general American public, he doesn't have a partisan uh, image, but he, but he certainly has a policy that he's been pushing, and that I think has dictated the terms of this debate. You know, routinely when I write about Pete Peterson and his work, which I've done a number of times over the years, I'll get, I must have gotten eight or nine emails from his press secretary and her predecessor, all of which, because I would identify him as uh, pushing a right wing, smaller government, austerity agenda, always outraged and always saying, no, he's nonpartisan, bipartisan, uh, he pushes liberal as well as conservative ideas, and I always write back with the same message, tell me some of them, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll correct. Uh, Pete Peterson was Richard Nixon's Commerce Secretary, then made a billion dollars in the hedge fund business, and has been on a campaign for more than 20 years of cutting Social Security and Medicare benefits. There were different reasons over, the reasons morph over the 20 years, but, you know, he was smart because he decided very early on that he was going to take a studied a nonpartisan looking approach to it by bringing in politicians from both parties and early on he cultivated a presidential candidate named Bill Clinton and has exploited him and his uh, his uh, 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 inner circle very effectively over the years but this is by any in common measure an austerity smaller government agenda and they've used the 2008 crisis in sort of shock doctrine fashion to say now more than ever we need to do the things that will in reality exacerbate the problems created by the 2008 crisis. Right, I, I think Peterson is really, play, he's, he's been playing a long game. I mean he may have known that it would take 20 years for his point of view to become really Washington orthodoxy and I think uh, 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 Frighteningly, that's that's where we are. In fact, when I wrote the, my column about Peterson and called him the most influential billionaire, I got some pushback from some people uh, I respect, uh, Kevin Drum, uh, Matt Iglesias, who said, well, he's not that influential because he's been pushing this line for 20 years and we still have Social Security and we still have Medicare and nobody's done what he's wanted. But the fact is that, that this is the terms this is the way we're talking now, and, and, and as, as we said, this is the debate. Uh, and and it, you're, you're right about, uh, you know, bipartisanship in this case really is sort of a, uh, a, a concealment. Yes, he's bipartisan, and that is that he's got his hooks into Republicans and Democrats, everybody from Clinton to, uh, uh, to, to John Boehner. Uh, in fact, um, I, I think Peterson announced, or one of his organizations, announced a conference to take place right about now in Washington and we got the uh, the guest list and, and one of my uh, uh, colleagues um, uh, in the press wrote to me and said who in Washington isn't connected to this guy and uh, I looked at it and I said well the only person whose name that I I, I don't see on here is Dean Baker who <laughs> is, Well uh, Bernie Sanders probably isn't coming uh, um, Bernie this is probably not there too, but these are two people who, who have been uh, some of the wisest analysts of what's really going on in, in, in fiscal terms, and they know they've got Pete Peterson's number, but unfortunately he's got everybody else's number, and, and this is really what's happening, I think, in, in these negotiations over the fiscal cliff. The starting point has become that the deficit is bad and we have to take care of it now before we do anything else, before we address 
uh, the, the need for continued job creation and the need for infrastructure uh, investment. At first, we're going to have we're, we're going to cut the deficit, which means there's going to be no money for any of those other things. Well, absolutely, and, and you know, as long as we're on the topic of bipartisanship, I just wanted to mention that there are two dimensions to that. One is the sort of bought and paid for bipartisanship of prominent party leaders in two parties. The other is the point of view that poll after poll after poll has showed that majorities of both parties hold, which is in direct opposition to the so-called bipartisanship of uh, the ones who have been working with Pete Peterson. If you poll Republican voters, 75 percent are against cutting Social Security for deficit purposes, 76 percent of Tea Party members, on and on and on, which is why Third Way's poll was so sus suspect from the the beginning that's the real bipartisanship here I think uh, that's right now um, one thing that that I think has got a lot of progressives concerned and certainly I see it when I hear from uh, from the social security advocacy community uh, where uh, th that, that I talk to uh, very often is that um, people in this community are uh, very su suspicious uh, or un uh, uncertain about where President Obama stands on all this. Um, I think the most direct, uh, uh, the, the, the bluntest defense of Social Security that we got during the presidential campaign actually came from Joe Biden, who was quoted as saying, it is off the table, there, is gonna, there are going to be no changes to Social Security. Uh, I can't remember if he mentioned the, the, the lame duck fiscal cliff negotiations or not, but it was a, the, the only truly full-throated defense of this program that I think we heard from the Democrats. Um, uh, Obama has talked about how Social Security, if it needs anything, only needs a few tweaks. But those of us who, uh, who followed the program and are advocates of the program uh, get a little nervous when we hear talk of tweaks because a tweak can be everything from... Uh, a, a very modest change in some term in the program to uh, uh, to a full scale assault, um, and and I think we need to be concerned also about where Medicare stands. So so why don't you give me some thoughts on on that on these two really crucial social insurance programs that that are being cursed with the label of entitlements, even though where I come from, an entitlement means something you're entitled to. Right. I think there are a couple things. One is that um, as far as, first of all, conflating... And by the, the way, I should just interrupt you for a moment. Alex Lawson from Social Security Works has just joined us. And, and Richard, give me your thoughts and then we'll, we'll go to Alex. Well, Alex, in conclusion, I'd like to... No. Um, the... Uh, well, first of all, uh, as Alex likes to say, you know, you conflate anything with Medicare in terms of future costs, and, and you're looking at a serious cost problem. But uh, I, I think the concern about Obama's intentions toward these programs is legitimate and real, first of all. And, and I say that for a couple reasons. One is that, you know, I would point to, for example, during the presidential debates when Obama said that he believed that he and Mitt Romney held essentially the same position, that the program needs a little tweaks, and in previous conversations, conversations and comments. Obama has said that surgical cuts would be appropriate, but, you know, surgical cuts, if you amputate the wrong leg, are, are never a pleasant experience. And, um, and uh, I have had meetings myself with very senior administration officials going back as far as two years ago saying that, you know, they hoped to uh, make changes to these programs off the record, so I can't give the names, but, you know, very senior. And others have, by the way, broken the uh, the, the, the blackout, but I won't do it. And um, so, you know, I think there's very legitimate reason for concern. Biden did say he could flat guarantee there would be no changes, but I think that's why Social Security advo advocacy groups uh, are so uh, rightly intent on making sure that the public uh, pressure is kept up to keep these programs off the table. Social Security does not contribute to the deficit by law, and Medicare's cost problems are cost problems that need to be addressed using, not by cutting benefits, but by addressing the drivers of those costs, which we right. can choose to get into or not, but they're, they they're are not benefit-driven. They're entirely external to the program. Uh, sure. Now I should introduce uh, Alex Lawson. He he, uh, uh, director of Social Security Works, one of the uh, leading uh, Social Security advocacy program uh, uh, organizations out there. And Alex, uh, I, I think, uh, got himself a measure of fame. At least, uh, I think the first time that that I saw him in action was a, a famous 
a, a video, or, or if not famous, it should be famous, in which you bearded Alan Simpson in his den, and I think evoked from him uh, one of uh, one of the outstanding utterances of misinformation or pure ignorance that Simpson is famous for. When I think you got him to talk about how the drafters of Social Security, uh, you know, knew that the people would die at at, at, at 60, so they set the retire they they set the limit at 57 or something like that. Anyway, uh, uh, that was great. And, and Alex, uh, Richard, and I have been talking about how um, the fiscal cliff negotiations really are just a stalking horse for austerity and and I think for an attack on Social Security and, and Medicare. So uh, why don't you give us uh, some of your thoughts in terms of what you hear being talked about in Washington that gives you pause uh, as a leading member of the Social Security Advocacy Community. Uh, thanks, Michael. And uh, yeah, that video with Alan Simpson was uh, a lot of fun. Uh, I, I was actually outside of the, the Bull Simpson Commission uh, live streaming the closed door because they wouldn't let uh, us live stream from, from inside. Um, and as they would come in and out of the the meeting I would I would try to get them to talk about what was going on inside and uh, Alan Simpson accidentally uh, said what they were actually planning uh, which was uh, to to decimate Social Security and that really was you know they were trying not to let the public know what was happening behind closed doors which has been the MO of the attacks on Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid all along, was they know that they can't do this in the light of day. They know that these are incredibly popular programs that across the board, um, Republicans, Democrats, self-identified Tea Partiers, they all say, hands off our Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Um, and so that that's the, the, the crux of this is that Elites in D.C. and elites in the media um, all know that the only way to accomplish these uh, dismantling of our critical systems is to do it behind closed doors um, or to create the false sense of a crisis um, so that they can slip cuts and this dismantling of the programs through. Um, right now, and, and I think you probably already noted, the, the, the really ridiculous thing is that they're pointing out that the fiscal the so-called fiscal cliff is incredibly dangerous because of the austerity and the effects of that austerity would be to bring the economy into a double dip recession right which is what we've seen in England for example uh, when you put in place these austerity measures it will it's, a, it's got contractionary effects right, on the economy. We're seeing it all across Europe uh, which absolutely ho hog for austerity uh, in the wake of the 2008 crisis, and they are really paying the price. But, uh, but uh, yeah, Alex, finish your thought. And, and, and so the part that I really think if, if people could, could, could un see how ridiculous it is, they're saying this is the problem, is these aus this austerity measures. But then they're saying the solution solution is just different austerity measures. So they're saying beware of the fiscal cliff, but embrace the so-called grand bargain, which, you know, in, in the office around here we say that's, you know, avoid the fiscal cliff, but jump into the Grand Canyon. Uh, it's the same thing, basically, except they're actually substituting um, in, in the so-called fiscal cliff, there are cuts to the defense, to defense um, and to the Pentagon, and so they're saying, well, let's get rid of those cuts and instead, we'll we'll substitute in some some pretty draconian cuts uh, with to Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. But it's the same austerity. It, it is at, right, and this, of course, is a the, as I mentioned, the theme of my column that'll be posted tonight and, and be in the paper tomorrow, which is that they're talking about austerity, and you know, in the sense of uh, the, the famous line from uh, Bernard Shaw, uh, you know, we know what you are. We're just talking about the price. Um, um, but uh, right, what what they're really talking about is who's going to get whacked uh, uh, by austerity. Now, um, um, the, you mentioned that uh, that uh, the the policymakers in Washington know that if they're going to take an axe to Social Security and, and Medicare, they have to do it behind closed doors. Uh, um, 
But the fact of the matter is, and one thing that I think we all have been concerned about is that uh, the ease with which misinformation about these programs uh, gets communicated to the press and gets picked up by by the elite media, and um, you know, there, nobody knows more about the shortcomings of big media than somebody who's in it, like myself. And I read these things, and and I'm often just appalled at how little uh, uh, my colleagues in the press seem to understand about how Social Security works and what it does, and and what its role is in the deficit, which is to say, no role at all. So, uh, and I know this has been a concern of Social Security works for some time, and, and I think we all grapple with uh, the, the task of how do we make sure that at least good information and accurate information gets communicated, uh, especially about Social Security. So, so what do you think really needs to be done, and how do we, how do we help uh, the, the press get it right? That's a really great question, Michael, and I think uh, a, a couple points on that. One is that, uh, you know, when we have somebody uh, like you who actually does understand the program, understands that Social Security has a dedicated revenue, uh, that uh, it, it's fully funded by the payroll tax, uh, it's got three streams of revenue, but it's got a dedicated revenue, so it, it can't by law borrow a penny. Um, we have to amplify the voices of people who are telling the truth about the program. Um, Richard has uh, done an amazing job of really uh, putting out in plain English uh, explanations uh, that uh, explain the, 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 the misinformation that is, you know, what it actually galls me when you have report reporters, so it's in, you know, it's not in the opinion pages, it's actually in the, in the, the reporting and it'll say things like social security is going bankrupt, right? Or right, or it's running out of money, um, and and things not like not that. Not only just reporters in the press, but Martha Raddatz, uh, you know, who got great praise for uh, right. moderating the vice presidential debate, but not to those of us who know anything about social security. We're we're aghast at her statement that it was going broke and increasing the deficit. Uh, you know, there's a fascinating dynamic here, Michael, that's it, really it's an anthropology issue. Uh, I, I've told people that some bright grad student in anthropology should study the behavior of the Washington elites because there have been, it's become among journalists there as well as decision makers, it's almost like you have to make your bones uh, the way mafiosi do by whacking a friend or something. You have to make your bones by saying, I'm not a liberal, I'm a realist. I know that Social Security is going broke. It's, it, 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 I was aghast. You know, the same meeting I mentioned earlier with a White House, uh, senior White House official, uh, I, I remember talking to someone afterwards about it and they were, uh, you know, and the saying is every. In fact, it was one of the people was Dean Baker, and saying, you know, is everybody lying? Is everybody bought off? And no, there's a there's a culture that takes over that says we're going to show we're tough, but the information is absolutely false. I mean, any program whose greatest financial pro or any individual whose greatest financial problem is that twenty two or three decades from now they're going to be making seventy five to eighty percent of what they're making now guaranteed is not going broke. So we need new terminology, uh, you know. In a way, you're embedded in part of, in a subculture of that culture, which is journalism. <laughs> and uh, you know, I think we all scratch our heads of you know what makes a well-intentioned person like Martha Raddatz or Jackie Combs at the New York Times or or Laurie Montgomery at the Washington Post to whomever over and over again, no matter how many times we write or send correctives, repeat the same information. I'm baffled by it. Right, and I, I know we've all tried. I, I, I uh, characterize it as uh, that those of us who are trying to uphold the principles of these programs and get it right and communicate it properly feel that we're in the position of Sisyphus. And if you know the myth of Sisyphus, sure. he, he had a roll of boulder. He was condemned to rolling a boulder up a mountain, and every time he got to the top, the boulder would roll back down again, and he'd have to start all over. And, and I, I think I, on several occasions I've pointed out that we're all in a position of, of communicating that the, the system is not going bankrupt, that there are real assets in the trust fund, that, uh, that, you know, that it, even if, for argument's sake, a crisis is 20 years off, that's a long time. Nobody, no business, no government agency, 
makes decisions today based on what it imagines are going to be conditions 20 years. IBM doesn't do it. Hewlett Packard they can't even look six months ahead, much less uh, 20 years ahead. Uh, and we, we do that just to the point that we think we've made the point. Then Martha Raddatz says, well, Social Security is going bankrupt, where the Washington Post gets it wrong, and the boulder is down at the bottom of the mountain, and we have to start all over again. So, One, um, one idea, and, and it's something that I say often, uh, and it's in direct response to your question of, of what do we do about this. Well, uh, the media landscape has changed, um, and one of the big changes in the media landscape is that people really do have the means of uh, reporting. It's, it's, the news has been democratized to a, a certain extent. And I think that, you know, when people are telling the truth on blogs uh, and they're writing up, uh, you know, the actual information and they're calling out um, the misreporting that they're seeing in the media, that is working. That, you know, it's not working it hasn't yet uh, totally stopped the misreporting, uh, but that is really important as well as uh, like Columbia Journalism Review has done an amazing job. Yes, it's Trudy out. Lieberman who who, uh, who rides herd, I think, on a lot of the misinformation, does a very good job. Uh, well, I think uh, we, we can uh, close it up here. Um, maybe just a couple of uh, thoughts from each of you. Um, uh, to uh, uh, to conclude, uh, Richard, why don't you go first and sort of give sure. us a, a quick well, broad. Uh well, sure. Well, first of all, as we were talking about, as Alex was talking about amplifying voices, I noticed a bullhorn on the shelf behind him, and that's one tactic. And you mentioned uh, you mentioned Sisyphus. I, I sometimes think of Cassandra, who is condemned to tell the truth and never be believed. But I'm a, I'm an optimist at heart. And look, you know, also a realist in the sense that I feel that those of us who are providing a more accurate view, you know, before I went into this, I, I was a consultant to government and corporations and above all else I believe in numbers working and logic working and and, and it, it feels now that some of us our role in the ecosystem of information is to be annoying and irritating and and and, and I don't like that it's it's not part of my personality but we do have to keep doing that as long as the misinformation goes out in order to instill some behavior modification and maybe force people to uh, report both sides of this story including the, the factually correct one. And if, if that's what we wind up doing through the great work of people like, like you and like Alex, then it will be time well worth spending. Right. A Alex, any uh, parting thoughts on uh, what people should listen for to know that they're being misled as the fiscal cliff negotiations get reported? I think uh, the, the key to me uh, is being a savvy news consumer and so when you hear things like social security is going bankrupt immediately you've got to uh, understand that that uh, messenger is not is not actually going is not as trustworthy um, and so understanding uh, you know the sources of news that you can rely on but I also think that it's common sense and I think that's uh, what, what the American people have uh, and there's a, a real deficit of it uh, in the elite uh, policymakers in D.C. And I think that when the American people can, you know, raise their voices, they're calling their senators, they're calling their member, and they're saying, you know, let's focus on the real crisis here. Um, let's focus on the fact that today there is an unemployment crisis, that tomorrow that same crisis will exist, that these are crises that are right now, and we've got to get our economy working again for the middle class, uh, and that that is going to be the greatest solution to any problems in the future is when we have the a majority of Americans uh, working and, and they want to work and there are good paying jobs for them to work and that is uh, specific to Social Security. That's the absolute best way to strengthen the program uh, is to really focus on the on the real crisis which is a jobs crisis uh, and, and just really be clear. Be super clear, no wiggle room. What we're saying is no benefit cuts to Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid. That is simple. Um, absolutely. That, that, that's the bottom line, and you're absolutely right that Social Security in particular, the, the, uh, the, the fiscal position of the program is very sensitive to economic growth, uh, and that really is uh, right. the, the job one that I think is being ignored 
in Washington. So thanks everybody for joining us. I've been joined uh, this afternoon by Richard R.J. Escal, um, uh, Senior Fellow at the Campaign for America's Future, uh, and Alex Lawson of Social Security Works, one of the great uh, advocates uh, of Social Security, and I'm Mike Hiltzik, business columnist here at the Los Angeles Times. Uh, so thanks to both of you for joining me, and thanks uh, to everybody who listened in.